Is there anything you've been really missing since the quarantine started? Like, I know that a lot of our females are really hating the fact that they couldn't go to the beauty shop. And it shows. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. That was a low blow. I apologize. Bless the pygmies in Africa and all that. Uh, for me, it's sports. I mean, you can, they have sports center every morning while I eat my breakfast and they've resorted to showing, you know, top 10 plays from 1997 and stuff like that. It's, it's pretty pathetic. But I got some good news this week. The SEC has stated that football practice can begin the first week of June. So I'm excited about that. I've really been missing college football. College football is, is like, uh, my, my hobby. It's the one thing that I kind of really get jazzed up about. Football in general, I'm not so much a, a, an NFL guy, but I do, I, I find it fascinating all of the strategy that goes into football. Uh, and you've probably noticed if you follow the NFL that the number one draft pick this year was a quarterback. Quarterbacks seem to be, you know, the part of, of a football team that makes or breaks it. You, if, for those of you Chiefs fans, you can, sympathize with that, right? For years and years, you've tried to find that that key component. And then when Patrick comes along, everybody's happy, happy, happy. But one of the greatest of all times, Peyton Manning. Don't you just love Peyton Manning? What made Peyton Manning so good was his ability to read defenses. And, and, and so if I'm speaking Greek, let me share with you what I mean by that. As the quarterback comes to the line, I didn't play quarterback. I played uh, a running back. But as the quarterback comes to the line and, and he gets under center or he's in the shotgun, what he's doing before he ever mench says one word is he's reading the defense. He's looking at the way the defense is set up. And, and so he's He's looking like at the work to fight, figure out who the middle linebacker is. And, and so he may point to one and say, 56 Mike or something like that, indicating what that does is that tells that, that offensive line kind of the blocking scheme or where the center of the football field is going to, or center of the defense is going to be so that they know how to block appropriately. And, and he also makes a read as he looks at the outside linebackers and the corners and the safety, he's doing what they call reading the coverage. And as football has moved through the timeline from way back in the 50s until current day, there's been more and more passing in, in the game. Running game isn't such a big deal anymore. But the quarterback has to have the ability to get under center and read that defense. He has to look at how those corners are lined up and, and, and see if there's one or two safeties and are they shading to one side of the field or, or the other. They need to be able to see if it's going to be a man defense or a zone defense. It's, it's this thing called the read that the quarterback makes. There are certain tells, T-E-L-L-S. There's certain tells that the defenders that are on the opposite side of the field will give off that the quarterback can recognize and then make appropriate adjustments for his offense. So before he snaps the ball, the quarterback has a lot of things that, that he has to worry about and certain decisions that he has to make. That offensive play, it, it's going to be based upon what he sees on the other side of the field. And, and so he's looking at that, and, and he's making some determinations. If you've ever watched Peyton Manning, you've heard him go, Omaha, 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 right? You've heard that. That is a, that's an audible that he's calling according to the play that they had versus the play that the defense appears to be making. Now, I say that because the defense can often hide their coverage and they can do certain things. But if you've watched your game film right and you've, you've made notes and you've memorized a lot of those things, you can see there's there's certain things that the defense will do that will kind of give you a key or a hint to what they're doing. You know, for us, I say all that, and I'm kind of going a long way around here, but I do have a point. There are certain reads that people make on us as individuals to determine whether or not our faith is real. 
just like that quarterback is looking and, and identifying where the Mike linebacker is or what the coverage is, people are looking at our life and there's certain things that they look at and they, they look at those external reads coming from our life and then they make a determination whether or not our faith is real or our faith is authentic. For the world, I mean, those that aren't a part of the church, some of those key reads will be, are they wearing a cross necklace? Uh, do they attend a church service regularly? It may be something like a Jesus bumper sticker or the Jesus fish on the back of the car. Within our churches, there are certain reads that we make. You, you know, whether you're raising your hands during worship or, or whether or not you're earnestly uh, praying during the time of prayer. Those are all some things that the world looks at. Here's the question that I want to pose this morning. What are, what are the key reads that God makes? What are the things that God considers to be the marks of true and authentic faith? James talks about that here at the beginning of chapter 2. Uh, before we read it, I want to make a, I want to make a de definition first so that we're all on the same page. I think it's wise any time that I begin to talk with, with certain church terminology that we identify key terms and, and, and d define them so that we all are on the same page. And the, the word that I want to make sure that is defined well this morning is the term religion. Uh, I've got it up here on the screen. The Greek word for that, for religion, is threskos. And, and when you see this word religion in the Bible, if it's been translated from threskos, it's pointing to external religious rituals Liturgies, that's, that, those are sayings or repeated poetry or prose that the church may use in worship or any kind of routines or ceremonies that, that are done within a church. Religious activities. You know, you know what I'm talking about. The things that you do in church, the stuff you do. That's, the word we'll see this morning will be religion and that's the Greek word that is used. This is this is just more than the religious rituals, liturgies. When it talks about dress costs here in James, end of James one, and then starting in verse or chapter two, what you're seeing is someone who is sold out with their religion. It's someone who goes to great lengths to make sure that all of the I's are dotted, all of the T's are crossed in all of their worship. We're talking about. They make sure that they say the, the exact right prayer. They may even have a, a prayer that they have memorized. Or they make sure that they're always there when communion is taken. Uh, they observe every religious uh, holiday. Uh, they, they are just on top of all of these religious ceremonies that take place within the church. Uh, loyal participation in the worship of a well-defined religious community or organization is what defines the religion that we're going to talk here. So as we read through this, and he, James will use this term religion, he's talking uh, about our external behavior, the things that we do. Now this is, I say all of this because this term religion, Threskos, in all of the New Testament, this is the only place that this used with this particular meaning and this definition. Normally when you read the New Testament, uh, and, and you'll, you'll see the writer refer to something, our godliness or our holiness, he doesn't re use religion. They use another Greek term, and that's Eusebius. Eusebius is, is uh, more commonly used throughout the New Testament. And that's really to, to mean holiness or godliness. But here, at the end of chapter 1 and starting of chapter 2, James uses threskos intentionally because he wants us to understand that he's talking about the things we do with relation to what we believe. And that's... It's, it makes complete sense when you understand that he has just finished telling us in, in chapter 1 that faith is proven not by what you say, by, but by what you do. 
So now he's going to answer this question. And the question that he's going to answer is, what are the things, what are the religious activities can we participate in that God finds as acceptable? What are the things that we can do with regard to our religion, what our faith, what are things that we can do that, that God would say that points and proves that that person is, is a person of true faith? They have an acceptable religion. Now, understand, this is God's standard, not ours. This is something that God has said He finds acceptable, not what the world or us or any Christian experts say is acceptable. He, James is going to communicate to us what God has to say are the qualifications that prove that our faith is real and genuine. The first one, look at James at the end of verse or chapter 1, starting with verse 26. Here's what he says. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Here's the first mark of true religion, uh, of the religion that God says is acceptable to Him. And James is saying right here at the very beginning, if you claim to be religious, or if you claim that your uh, religious things that you do are acceptable to God, then you need to know this. If you can't control your tongue, then your religion, the things that you do, are worthless. So he's backing the person, the believer into the corner and he's stating, now you think that because you go to church or you think that because you wear the Jesus cross or you have the fish on the back of your car, you think that that's what proves your faith. Well, if you can't control your tongue, all of that stuff is worthless. If you're the type of person that gives in to the temptation and lacks the self-control and, and, and is always cursing, of course, that's kind of the no-brainer. If, you're, if your tongue is cursing or you're a person of rash talk or maybe you, you're known to slander other people, you talk negatively about them or, or you're a person who gossips regularly, or maybe you're just the kind of person that always just has really destructive and negative speech. James is saying that uh, those external religious rituals that you point to and would say, this proves that I'm a Christian. And, and so he's saying, you say that those things point and say that I'm a person of true faith. But yet your speech betrays you. Your speech says that your faith is not authentic. You want to believe that all of those religious rituals and ceremonies and liturgies that you're participating in point, would point to you as a true believer. But James is saying those things are worthless and they have no power over your life to make changes in how you act and what your heart says. You know, the way we speak is an indicator of a changed heart. Jesus said in Matthew 12, He says, for whatever is in your heart, that determines what you say. Your, your words are a window into your soul. And so when you speak, you're pulling back the curtains and allowing people a, a, a peek into who you truly are and how authentic your faith truly is. Your tongue then becomes a test of authentic Christianity. Now, not the only indicator, not the only test, but an indicator. So, think about what you say daily. Think about how you speak to other people. Consider what you put on Facebook. Now, I know that's not verbally speaking, but it is speaking. You're communicating. Think about how you text other people or what you like to communicate about, or what your conversations are full of. James is saying, those things, if those things aren't godly, then you can just trash everything that you point to to say that your faith is real. Your faith isn't real. It isn't genuine if you can't keep rain on your tongue. Look at the next one. Verse 27. James says, pure and genuine religion. Now, I'll pause for just a second. He adds these terms. And so he's clarifying 
before he just mentioned religion. Now he's really drilling down and he says pure and, and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father. So he's talking about God's standards. God says here, what he's saying, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So this is the second thing that James points to as an indicator from God that God says as an indication of whether or not our faith is genuine. And he uses those terms, pure and genuine. Some translations use pure and undefiled. The NIV, I think, says faultless, doesn't it? Here, what he's talking about, religion is genuine. This is biblical Christianity. And he says, and this is one of the very few places within the New Testament that there are specific directions uh, and commandments for how Christians are supposed to behave. But this is what he says, that pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. He's talking about being moved by the needs of other people and then taking action to meet those needs. You know, the, the New Living Translation says just simply caring. That's what my translation says. It says caring for orphans and widows. But in other translations, as I, I wanted to double check to see what other translations, how they interpreted the Greek, they, they say to visit or look after. So it's, but it's more even than just dropping by for a visit at the nursing home. And it's more than just throwing a few coins at the feet of that orphan beggar. This is active participation in seeing that the well-being of another person is met. The term is translated here is to actually seek them out. Go to them. And then it talks, the Greek says that we are to, as believers, our behavior, the things that we should do is we should exercise oversight of those that are, what's it say, in distress. That we're to provide help in any way necessary. When, when you think about this and, and why these two particular groups of people, the, the orphans and the widows, are, are specifically mentioned here, it's because these are the most helpless of all of humanity. They're the, th- these groups of people are the most susceptible to exploitation. You realize that orphans in the world are kidnapped or taken and then used in the worldwide trade for sex. Widows are preyed upon in our communities. How many times have I heard stories of widows receiving phone calls? They have been targeted by people who were trying to fleece them out of their, their finances. These are the people that are, that are exploited the greatest in our society. They are the neediest among us. They are the desolate and they are the destitute. They have no one to protect them. They have no one to look over them and, and care for them. Think about the widows. You know, at the time of James's writing here, this is about 40, 50, 60 B.C. or A.D., somewhere in there. And when he writes this, things like life insurance don't exist. There's, there's no fallback plan for a widow. There's no Social Security that they will receive from the passing of their husband. Women, in fact, specifically widows, it was very difficult for them to find employment. Women are always the last to be employed in James's culture. So they can't go out and find a job and provide for themselves. If they do, it's often at the cheapest wage. They're the ones that receive the lowest salaries. They don't have any government programs to fall back on. No no government agencies to provide for them. That's the reason James identifies widows and for orphans. I mean, it kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? Orphans have no parents to provide for them and protect them. Orphans don't even have anybody to give them that much needed love. That's what determines their self-worth. 
as they become adults. Both groups of people are, are they have no one to protect them. No one that sees uh, and over, oversees for their well-being. Orphans, in fact, have a special place in the Lord's eyes. In Psalm 82, it says, Give justice to the poor and the orphan. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Do you realize that in our world today, there's a, approximately 163 million orphans around the world? And you know from my personal story that I've had the opportunity firsthand to see orphanages in other countries, and it's not a pretty sight. One afternoon when we was visiting the orphanage, one of the caretakers came to me and the other American that were there to visit our children and asked us if we would be willing, because I guess we were about the only men around there, if we would be willing to move a dresser for them. And we, we agreed, it's no problem, we'll move a dresser for you if you need us to. And she took us to another part of the building. And, and when she opened the door, um, it, was, it was a room about the length of this room right here. And it was crib after crib after crib after crib of babies. Just one after another. Just, just from here to that back wall of maybe four rows of cribs just like that. Orphans don't have anybody to care for them. Basically, those orphanages in, in other countries are just doing the, the very basics to make sure that they're fed and they have shelter. They don't have anybody rocking them at night. They don't have anybody that's praying for them by name. And the Lord looks down and, and His heart breaks for the orphans. Scripture is very, very clear about our, the responsibility of the believer with regard to those who are viewed as the most disposable in our culture. We, talking about Christians, we are God's tool to ensure that the most helpless among us are cared for and protected and that they receive justice. The Christian church could do a, a way better job at making sure that these groups of people are, are provided for. Authentic Christians touch people's lives. Authentic Christians work towards the well-being of those who don't have anybody working towards their well-being. And this is not a, a recommendation. This isn't a, uh, hey, maybe this is a good idea. This is a commandment. This is a mandate. This is an obligation that we have as believers to look out for the well-being of widows and orphans. At the very end of 27, he says, uh, he says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. That means that you're taking a stand against all that the world believes and all the trappings that the world falls into. All of the behavior that the world seems to find as, as natural coming to them. And he gets real specific in this next verse. Look here. The ver uh, chapter 2, verse 1. My dear brothers and sisters, again he's talking to Christians, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, if you favor some people over others. When not, the third thing that we see that they're pointing to here is refusing to let the world corrupt you. That's a clear separation from the ways of the world. And James says that we should not favor some people over others. That's, a, that's one of the ways that we allow the world to corrupt us. There's in the early church, we're talking not very many years after Jesus ascends to heaven. Do you understand what the early Christian church was made up of? The who were sitting in those meetings 
It wasn't the well-to-do. It wasn't the government officials. It wasn't those with power or influence. Those that came to faith uh, in the greatest number were the poorest. The early church was made up, by and large, the bulk of the early church was the poor. Those were the ones that were coming to faith. But then a problem began to surface in that early church. That's the reason James is addressing it here. Even though those, those early believers come from the poorest in society, they were still allowing the ways of the world to corrupt them, and, and they began to show favoritism to anyone of wealth who would attend their meetings. This is just a dynamic that seemed to start bubbling to the surface there in that early church. James is saying, okay, don't you remember who you were? You're the poor of the poor. And now what you're saying, you're allowing the world to corrupt you and it's coming out by when the rich man comes in and how you treat them. Look at verse 2. James gives us a good example here. This is a little scenario. For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another one comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives or influenced by the ways of the world? So it's easy to imagine this scenario, isn't it? The, the rich man and the poor man both coming, uh, arriving at the meeting at the same time, and, and the greeters, I'm sure they had greeters that looked like Johnny back there. As they come in, the rich man and the poor man, they're greeted, the rich man is greeted well, and he's escorted at that time. The, the best seats were in the front. I don't know how we flipped that, but we have. But at that time, the best seats were in the front, and so the greeters, the poor, they would escort the wealthy and the affluent to the best seats, greet them warmly, but the poor man comes in and it's kind of like, you can have that seat back in the corner or just sit on the floor. The, the poor man's ignored. He's greeted passively. I, I can just see it, can't you? But there's, there's definitely favoritism being shown here. In ancient Rome and Palestine, it was really, really easy to tell the rich from the poor. Sometimes the lines are blurred here. Um, and you really can't tell unless you really know a lot about a person. But during this time, the rich were the only ones that could afford clothes that weren't handmade. And the rich were the only ones that could afford a gold ring. They were the only ones that uh, had access to finances to purchase jewelry. And so it was, it was absolutely a clear indicator that you are a person of affluence if you come in and it was obvious you weren't wearing something that you made at home and you had a gold ring on. And so as those affluent, as the affluent would show up at the meetings simply maybe out of curiosity, what's going on? Why is this? Why are there so many people coming? I want to hear more about this Jesus. As they arrive at the meetings, the affluent or the poor is actually tripping over themselves to get to the affluent and show them a good time. This is still an ongoing issue today. It maybe isn't so overt. Uh, I was in a deacon's meeting one time, several years ago, where uh, I heard a deacon make a strong argument and recommendation that the church staff should be going to great lengths to make connections with the new banker that had moved in town. I'm just going to let that set there for just a little bit. There's obviously a reason that, I mean, it wasn't like he wanted us to reach out to the new school teacher that had moved to town but specifically the new banker. 
You know, I've also heard of churches that strategically aim their evangelical efforts at, at particular neighborhoods. There's a reason for that. There's ulterior motives. It's, it's basically showing favoritism. Favoritism is a common way the church or the believers in the church, we slide into worldliness. Sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it. But favoritism and faith in Christ, they're incompatible. It goes against everything that, that God says, every grain of God's teaching and how He works, it's incompatible, favoritism is. Hey, can we all just agree on this universal truth that the, the poor never get a break, the poor never get a fair deal, there's never anybody that advocates on behalf of the poor. There's even, even government politicians that, that, that speak in terms that they want to protect the poor or provide for the poor. Would you not agree that they're simply doing that to exploit the poor in order to garner more votes? Or am I just cynical? So I would ask, who contends on behalf of the poor? Well, Scripture is very clear that Jesus does. Just read the Bible. Verse after verse supports the contention that God is concerned for the poor. And so favoring the wealthy or the affluent, it's completely antithetical to Jesus' actions. I mean, think about this. When Jesus was on this planet and He was walking around and spending time with people, who did He gravitate towards? The poor. Who did He spend time with? The poor. Who did He dine with? Think about all that He went through and all the ridicule that He endured. Whose behalf was it on? Jesus gravitated to those that, that were at the bottom of the social pyramid. So we're talking the poor. He would, he, he would gravitate towards women, Samaritans, people of... So it's not even has to do with wealth. Sometimes it's just we show favoritism based on external factors like race. But Jesus would spend time with Samaritans or, or lepers, people who were seen as unclean, people that... If you would ask a Pharisee, they would say this person's a sinner. He, you know, he spent time and shared his teachings a lot with prostitutes. Some of the greatest uh, ministries that I have seen over the past 10 years that are really booming and taking place are amongst prostitutes, specifically in Las Vegas. There's all kinds of ministries that are reaching out to prostitutes in Las Vegas. You want to talk about uh, going to those that are the least among us. And Jesus, for these people, Jesus is their only hope. Not the government. Definitely not the government. You realize in all of the history... <coughs> In all the history of mankind, there has never been a governmental program that has solved the plight of the poor. Wasn't it in the 60s where Lyndon Johnson declared war against the poor? How's that turned out for us? Think of the millions and millions of dollars that have been spent by this country in welfare, unemployment, caring for single mothers. And I'm, those things are all good. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be happening. But if you're looking to the government as the answer, you're going to have a long wait. They don't have the answer. The only answer is Christ. In fact, the government compounds the problem and makes it worse. Second thing about favoritism that it, when a believer shows favoritism, we're usurping God's sovereignty. I'm having trouble talking. 
You see, we judge people and we determine their value based upon external factors. That judgment, whatever we then see, that judgment then determines how we treat that person. We assess their looks or, or what they own or where they live or what color their skin is and then we assess value to that and then we treat them accordingly. You know the term favoritism? It really means receive according to the face. That means you look at the face and then you receive them according to what they look like. Or uh, favoritism, like somebody gives you a gift, you look at it and you make a determination whether or not you'll receive it or not. It makes us the determinant of the other person's value, of their worth. I don't want that on my conscience. I don't know about y'all. Number three thing about favoritism is, is that we see that God never shows favoritism. He sees all of us equally. In Colossians chapter 3, it says this. And, and this is Paul writing. Paul says, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and He lives in all of us. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, before you get your pitchforks out, light your torches, and, and start an anti-wealthy person group, James is not against the wealthy. He's not against uh, affluence. He's not against those who are blessed financially. There's nothing wrong with being rich. He's just saying that, that God doesn't favor the wealthy more than the poor, and He doesn't favor the poor more than the wealthy. But there is a truth that exists within this. And that is that God does choose to bless the very people that this world has deemed the lesser of us. Those that are shunned in this world, God sees their plight and chooses to bless them. Although they may hold the lowest positions in this world, Scripture is very clear that one day they will be exalted to the highest positions in God's kingdom. We, I'll take you back a couple weeks in James 1.9. It says this, Believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. So James's illustration, it's not about a rich man or a poor man. If, if you think that that's what James's illustration about is about the rich man and the poor man, you're completely off base. The illustration is to point out the person who's doing the judging. That's what the illustration's about. Because to favor one person over another person with prejudice. If, if that's what you do, you are guilty of discrimination. Making distinctions between two people it is always backed by an evil ulter ulterior motive. There's something within us that's prodding us, that, that has its roots in evil that says, show the fluent favor, shun the poor. And I do want to restate this just real quickly and then I'm going to wrap it up. Favoritism isn't always related to wealth. Sometimes it has to do with our, the color of our skin or our, our nationality. And that dynamic is still prevalent in the evangelical church today. Take a moment and look around the room. Anyone a different skin color in here? Now, it's difficult in our, in, in our context. Well, we don't have a lot of people of different races that live in our community. I get that. But when you go to Atlanta, Georgia, 
or you go to Nashville, Tennessee, or you go to Little Rock, Arkansas, you go to Dallas, Texas, what you'll see is that black people tend to attend black churches and whites are most likely to attend white churches. We segregate ourselves. Sometimes that's simply because of the racial makeup of the community that they live in. You know, a, a really strong black community, you're not, you're not going to drive halfway across town just to desegregate yourself. You're going to, and, and sometimes we just naturally want to be around people that are like us, right? That we can, that we identify with. But homogenous churches, we exude the appearance to the world that we exclude people. It's just the way it is. And I'm, hey, I'm preaching myself as much as I'm preaching to y'all. Someone of a different race moves to Purdy. Do you really think that they would feel welcome or included to come here? Honestly. Make an honest assessment here. I don't know that they would. My, I, I sincerely hope that they would. I hope that I hope that they would feel loved, included, accepted. But there's just something evil and dark within our hearts. And we may not even know anything about the person, but when we see them or we see what color of skin they have, that we make judgments. We stereotype. So your behavior may not be overt to someone showing a racial bias. But just be cautious. It can be within your mind, in, within your subliminal thoughts. I'm guilty of it. I'll just be the first to admit it. I do it. And, and every time I do, I have to repent. I have to tell the Lord, I, Lord, I apologize for the way that I stereotype that person. I believe that the, the makeup of the local church should look more like heaven will look like. And believe me, when we get to heaven, it ain't going to look like this. It ain't. There'll be a lot of people in heaven that don't look anything like you. So, I, just let me wrap this up, okay? I don't want to be a downer. I'm not being about a downer. Uh, you, but, you know, in Purdy, we're kind of isolated from the, all of these issues, right? So we don't really have to deal a lot with racial segregation and things like that. I mean, probably, what, 98, 97% of Purdy is is Caucasian. So, but let me just wrap this up by saying that, you know, the, the religion, our religious behavior, religion, the things we do, that is approving to the Lord, that isn't about what you do here on Sunday. God's not happy just because you came to church. God's not happy because you sang uh, worship songs this morning. Here's the th what pleases the Lord. It's, and I'm going to boil those three topics down. Do you live with a pure heart? And that pure heart is evidenced by how you talk, how you treat other people. Do you treat other people with compassion? or And do you treat them without favor? Do you treat everybody equally? God says, that's religious behavior that pleases me. Not whether or not you raise your hands in church or you've got the Jesus necklace or the Jesus fish. What pleases the Lord, are you living with a pure heart? So take the afternoon. I know y'all ain't got nothing better to do. Ain't no sports on. Maybe watch NASCAR, it's about it. Hope for somebody to wreck or something. I mean, that's the reason we watch NASCAR, ain't it? Just hoping somebody wrecks. I'll fall asleep and I'll hear, somebody's wrecked. Oh, we'll watch it now. But take the afternoon. I want you to consider thrust costs. Consider your thrust costs. If someone heard you speak and the things you say and how you address other people, would they peg you as a disciple of Christ or a spawn of Satan? Consider the, the, the least among us in our communities. When's the last time you intentionally sought out sought to care for those that have no one else to care for? Have you ever took on the responsibility of, of 
overseeing the well-being of someone who had no one else overseeing their well-being. Have you ever went and, and reached out and, and mentored so, uh, an orphan or took an orphan in or, or made sure that their financial needs were cared for or their physical needs? You know, maybe, maybe you support, uh, you know, work through compassion or something like that. And, and lastly, are you guilty of showing favoritism? Do you gravitate towards people who are more like you? Do you find that you have a tendency to be nicer to people that can do something for you? Or do you treat everybody equally? You know, sometimes in the favoritism, you don't even realize that you're doing it. So if your answers point to anything less than pure and genuine religion, I would encourage all of us to spend some time, spend some time in prayer repenting of those behaviors and those sinful attitudes. Begin to make adjustments in your life that would reflect that pure and genuine religion that James is writing about. And remember, it's not just limited to these three. It's not just limited to how you talk and the orphans and, and showing favoritism. But James uses these three because they were a major problem in his church at that time. But I think they're still relevant to us today. Let's pray. Father, um, as the pastor here, I have to be the first to stand up and, and take the bullet and admit that I am guilty of these sins.